Opioid addiction is a national public health crisis that affects individuals and families regardless of their age, race, or income. The statistics are overwhelming. More than 130 people die from opioid addiction every day. But there is hope. Recovery is possible. Today on Someone You Know, we're speaking with Malik and Lisa, two artists with very different connections to the opioid crisis, but one giant similarity. Malik, a photographer, is currently in recovery and working with the One Day at a Time organization, or ODAT, as you'll hear in this episode. And Lisa has been caring for a loved one in recovery and started a program called Project Epidemic with the goal of bringing awareness to addiction through art. While Malik and Lisa's story may be very different, the two explain their connection to each other and the inspiring story of how they met. Together, Malik and Lisa share their story of how they are destigmatizing addiction and inspiring hope. I'm your host, Heather Major, and this is Someone You Know. I want to thank you both for just your, your, your courage and your willingness to participate in the Someone You Know campaign, um, for sharing your stories, but, and more importantly, for being here today that, you know, we want to continue to talk. People are curious about where are you now, you know, a little more about how you got here and a little bit more about where you're going. Let's talk a little bit about your journey with addiction before you, you found a path to recovery. What was a day in the life of Malik like? I'll give you a, a glimpse into my worst day. I can remember waking up and uh, questioning God why he woke me up and allowed me to wake up again. And what am I going to do today? How am I going to get high all day long? Because it's a kind of expensive habit. I was staying in a shelter. So it was just a constant all day long of how am I going to get uh, more drugs. And then once I got the drugs, then the instant thought was, uh, how am I going to keep getting them now? Because it has to go through the whole day, the night, have something for the morning. It was it was such a, a miserable existence. And I would do whatever it took within certain limitations to make money to use. Did you ever have any peace in your days then? I wouldn't call it peace. The only time where I would say I didn't have such of a stressful, more desperate mm-hmm. attitude uh, was like if I had a lot of money that day. Then I guess it was more like party time, um, and I didn't have the stress that came along with it every day. But even then, it was like it was empty, you know, because even though I had the money to get all of the days I had the money to get all the drugs that I may want, it still was empty. Um, it was no one, it was nothing real. So it was really like a, the worst time in my life imaginable. It sounds lonely. It was very lonely, very self-centered. Everything, anything in the course of that day had to do with me benefiting from it. If it didn't benefit me, I'm not do it. involved, I'm not interested. Do you feel like, from your experience, do you feel like addiction makes you feel selfish? Yeah, the core model of addiction deals with uh, obsession and compulsion. And total self-centeredness or self-obsession you know, is the core of the disease itself. And that's why it's such a big thing for me to do for others and help others because the total opposite of self-centeredness is doing for someone else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say definitely selfish. Addiction brings the worst out of you. What was it like, though, to make that, whether it was the first time or the second time that you wanted to seek treatment, what was that like? What was your sort of tipping point at those moments? Actually, um, I got arrested. And that's what, uh, I needed something greater than me to stop me. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, for months prior to that, I wanted to stop. I was tired of it. It But breaking that cycle isn't just as easy as just, hey, I think the day I'm done. It's not about the want. Right. But the opioids is not even just a a, a psychological. You have to also deal with the physical addiction as well. So some days it was just to stay not sick, you know, because you feel like you're dying when you're sick. So you just want to stay not sick. And now they got the fentanyl that they're putting in it. It's, it's increased it to where now the normal things like methadone, suboxone maintenance, uh, for some people, like, that didn't work for me. I tried it, and I was still sick. And when you're feeling terrible like that, it's hard to you know, to think straight and make a sound decision on what to do. So, yeah, it was uh, it was something greater than me to stop me. And at that point, once I think that I had that opportunity, now because I have no choice, 
now I'm going to maximize. I'm going to make the best out of it because as soon as I can get this physical part done, then I can work on, on my brain. Mm -hmm. I'd had eight and a half years clean before it, and I had lost my business, and I felt I couldn't do it. I questioned myself. My, self, my, my confidence in myself uh, was gone. So once I got the physical aspect done, jail did that for me. That's when I went to ODAT. And when I went to ODAT, then they helped me to uh, really, because Mel already knew Mel, and he had faith in me more so than I did. I just rolled off of his faith that he had in me not to let him down, but at that time, I still really didn't believe in myself. And it took a lot of positive reinforcements and me actually doing some things to kind of build my belief and my self-confidence back up. And now, how do you feel about yourself? Ah, now, um... I'm, I'm very confident, but I, I never want to come off seeming arrogant. I want to be confident, but humble. So, like I said, not the first time you've met. Do you want to tell us a little story about where you, where you first met, and then now maybe where you are with, with your relationship? All right, I was in uh, active addiction, and I frequented the Kensington area. And so I remember one day, I believe I had seen uh, the, uh, Lisa outside, uh, they were doing crocheting, so I saw them a couple times. I'm not a big crocheter, so it didn't, you know, I didn't uh, just stop. And then one day, though, um, as I was walking past, I don't remember what it was uh, that Lisa said to me, but she said something, and when she said it, uh, she just had this real bright smile. And at that moment, I guess the smile was what I, I, I needed, because I was in probably one of the lowest points in my life. And um, she just was like, hey, why don't you come and stop and, and crochet? And I was like, uh, all right. <laughs> and uh, I stopped and I crocheted. And uh, I forget what I made, but it was more the uh, experience. And it always stands out because it's hard to, uh, I don't understand how or what it was that made uh, me stop. Because when you're in addiction, it's just a constant, ongoing, all day, like, job. <laughs> and you take no time out for anything. You forget the pleasure tees and the normalities of, you know, sometimes even being so-called human. But it was just something in her spirit that got me to stop. And I stopped and that's where the connection was made. And, um, you know, so I don't even think she knew at that point how powerful it was to me. Um, and then I just frequently started coming through and then I disappeared yes. and uh, went and got into recovery. And the next time we saw each other was here with you guys at uh, at the conference. At the community conversation? Yeah, at the community yeah. conversation. Yeah. And I was like, and, and I saw her and she saw me. And I was like, I know her. And I couldn't figure where I knew her from. And she was being discreet and said, well, you know, I'm not going to put you out there and say where it was. And then it came to me, Lisa. And from that point, you know, it was just, it was a great moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. And Malik, you had mentioned in, in the blog how great it was for Lisa to see the real you. Yeah, because um, when you're in addiction, it's not really you. It, it, it kind of forces you to become just, it brings, brings you down to like an animalistic level uh, even so. So it was a pleasure for her to be able to meet, you know, who I really am. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we're great friends. I consider her a great friend and an inspiration, and she always have a part in my story. It's pretty incredible. It is. So oftentimes when somebody comes through the storefront um, and we don't see them for a while, we don't know what happened to them. So, you know, sometimes we think they could be in recovery or they could have died. Mm. So when I saw you at the community conversation, I didn't know who you were at first, but I knew that I knew you. You know, I'm looking at you like, I know that guy, I know that right. guy. And then it came to me, but before it came to you. Right. And so, um, you know, you were trying to guess. Oh, I know you're from here. I know you're from here. And I was like, mm, no. But I didn't want to say where I knew you from. And then I think I took you aside and said, we know, you, uh, we know each other from this Kensington storefront. Or you had maybe said, I know you're from Kensington. Yeah, could it have been? How long had it been? So the storefront started two years ago. Yeah, so it had been maybe a year and some change. Yep, yep. Since I saw <laughs> And I remember sitting across from you at the table and you were weaving. Yeah. And yeah, I remember you. 
Right, and I'm still, how does she get me to weave? I don't understand <laughs> that. I don't like, know, it's funny. Yeah. yeah. People kind of look at us like, well, you're doing what? Yeah, in and now I'm a weaver. I'm a fisherman. Right, you're a weaver. <laughs> so Malik, do you still see the same smile when you see Lisa? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and there's something in the, in the eyes, too. The eyes are like, you know, they say the gateway to the soul. The soul sure. um, so something in the eyes when she smiles, and it just, you know, it, it brightened my day. That's a, whew, that's a powerful uh, yeah. blessing to have. Because you just never know, like, who you're really helping just by giving somebody a smile or saying good morning. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it go a long way. Mm -hmm. Is that part of why both of you wanted to be a part of this campaign? What's the power of that connection in terms of, you know, helping to destigmatize addiction as well? I mean, to destigmatize addiction is a, is a huge undertaking, and no one person can do it. I think that, um, you know, you said something about how uh, you're not yourself when you're in active addiction, but still there's something that, uh, that I saw in you, you know, a connection that I knew that I could make, and I still knew that something sparked between us, and so there was a connection, and, and I don't know, I, I still, I never ever see people as not human, mm -hmm. you know, even, even in active addiction, so I always want to make that connection at the storefront, you know, somebody walks in and they're, you never acted um, anything but respectful when you were down there, but, you know, sometimes people are doing things that they normally wouldn't do and they're acting a certain way, but, um, you know, we always like to keep in mind that that's, that's the addiction and it's not the person mm. inside. I think that's actually maybe even um, the key to it, because um, uh, one, two, you just said it, that I made the connection, and because when you're, when you're, you're in active addiction, you're, you're probably, you know, you, I was dirty, I didn't look, you know what I mean, presentable, and so self, looking at my self-awareness at that point, I'm feeling very low myself. So for you to look at me without seeing, you know what I mean, the, uh, the outer and just looking at the, at the me, the human in me, maybe that's what the, uh, the connection was because I didn't feel stigmatized. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I think that's probably what it was, you just looking past everything and not uh, placing me in, you stigmatizing me and placing right. me in the box and just seeing that I was a person. Well, let's go back and then we'll go forwards. Um, Lisa, the word art sort of has a double entendre for you, right? You wanna tell us a little bit more about that? So I grew up in Kensington and uh, I had a friend who lived near me, a very good friend of mine. And um, as we grew up, we sort of grew apart. You know, she got into things that I wasn't into, um, but we always talked throughout the years. And then, um, she had children and she also, all, all that time, I probably knew, but maybe I wasn't so aware of it, but she also was dealing with addiction. And um, at some point her addiction um, became so bad that it was hard for her to take care of her children. Mm -hmm. So my husband and I offered to take care of her children for her while she you know, got her life back on track. Um, so that turned into a few years of the kids living with us, us having custody of them. One of the kids was Art, which if I should back up just a little bit, um, I met him when he was a baby and there was like an instant connection with him. He was like my little buddy. We would just spend time together. Um, and he's a, he was very creative too. So we had that connection too. Um, and then when uh, we decided to, to help her, and take custody of the kids, it was really because of him, you know, because I had, we had such a connection with him that we wanted to help. So they lived with us for a few years and then um, all of them went back with family members after a few years. And I lost touch with Art for a few years. Um, and in those few years, he started using. So, um, you know, we got back in touch when he was probably like early 20s and uh, he was at a really low point in his life and um, he struggles with addiction too as do his both of his siblings uh, and he needed a place to stay so we decided to invite him back to our home to live for a little bit so he lived with us for a while um, our agreement was always that if he were to relapse that he would need to find somewhere else to live um, we didn't really keep up with that agreement because he relapsed several times in our home and we always just let him stay. 
Um, and I guess the last time he relapsed was, was really bad and he didn't want to be there anymore because I think he didn't want my daughter to see him like mm -hmm. that. Um, so, so he left, uh, we still kept in touch all, like I was always the person that he could call no matter what. Um, I always took his calls even when he was using, um, and you always said, I love you at the end of those Always calls. said, I love you. Because someone once told me, like, what if that's your last conversation yep. with that person? How do you want your last conversation to be? And I never knew if it was going to be my last conversation. That's your boundless love. Yeah. It's really special. So how is Art doing today? He's doing great. He's got an um, almost three-year-old daughter. And we talk often, just about every day. It's really great to see him, to see him in recovery and to see him happy and doing his thing that's wonderful the whole part of the whole purpose of your storefront and of epidemic is to do something for someone else <laughs> so when I started epidemic I started it um, for people as a way to communicate uh, in an easy way they didn't have to talk to me they could just write it on a piece of uh, fabric and I started it to, to make 114 panels I believe it was which was the number of people who overdosed each day in the US um, who died of an overdose each day in the U.S. So, um, you know, I'll just continue to do Epidemic. I'll just be there at events for people to write their feelings, for people to make a connection. Um, I see the art that I make, the Epidemic project that I'm doing, as a way to make connections, um, as a way for people to see that they're not alone in this. Um, look at all of these other messages that have been written. Like, all of these people are feeling so many of the same things that you're feeling. Let's talk about that, about how um, art is transformative and, and why that's a big part of, of your story, Lisa, and it's, it's part of your journey to Malik, even though you may not have wanted to weave, you were open to weaving and you sat and down and you, it. and you enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. It clearly shows that your love is boundless and you, know, you, you love people through art and through other means, but how has that helped you? Art isn't always about like making a thing. It's often about the process, and that's art anywhere you go. Art is about the process. Um, but at the storefront, art is about creating community. Like, come on, join us. You can do this. You know, you might not be a weaver. You may maybe never wove before, but you can sit down and you can do this with us. We'll teach you. Mm -hmm. And then when you learn, you can teach somebody else. So I think that art creates community, and through community, it creates healing. Yeah, I would add that I think you're also teaching love and compassion. You know, just by being you and by virtue of what you're offering to people and in an in a environment that's safe and, you know, that people feel comfortable in, regardless of where they are in their life. How has art been for you? Uh, I, I love art. I love all, all types of art. At that moment, I wasn't too into art. <laughs> um, and I had never wove. But it gave me something to, to focus on. And... At that moment, I just felt peaceful. But I think it's, it, it, was a, it was a lot of things going on, because it was the art, but it was her spirit more that got me to stop. The art kept me focused once she got me to stop, but it was her spirit that really got me to stop. So I don't think, I don't think anyone could have got me to stop and weave at that moment. But Lisa did. Yep, I think <laughs> it, it, it had to be Lisa or someone with the same uh, spirit mm -hmm. as Lisa. And as she said, because even though I was addicted, I never was a bad person. I, I grew up with morals, principles. Um, so I never, there were many things that I, I, I never uh, forsake those things that I was instilled in me. So I was always a good person. I just was caught up. I think that's a big part of stigma, or at least destigmatizing addiction, that it's not about bad people. Yeah. You know, this is a disease that un has unfortunate, you know, consequences. And it is really refreshing, though, to hear both of your stories and, and sort of the, you know, while there are struggle, there's also joy. Um, there's a lot of joy in the work that you get to do, Lisa, and there's a lot of joy in the life that you live. And from what I can tell from both of you, there's a lot of joy um, in just being able to help others. You have such passion for other people and to help other people. What about yourselves? And where do you see yourselves individually, like, in your futures? I studied graphic design. So, like, my plan was to be a graphic designer in an office somewhere. And then somewhere along the line, I don't know what happened, but here I am back in Kensington, <laughs> like, making art on Kensington Avenue under the L 
and it's amazing and and it's like I was supposed to be doing this could you imagine yourself doing anything but that now no I would like to be there forever (laughs) how about you Malik well I guess with me they say you can the true measure of a man is by how many people that how many lives he can touch Uh, so that's what my I believe that's my purpose in life Um, and I just want to be as effective as I can. Like I'm in, I'm in college now. I uh, plan to. I want to stay with ODAT, but I would like to grow. That's why I love ODAT because I work there. But Mel gives me enough leeway to do a lot of the things that I want to do with my passions, and he backs me. He supports all of us. I think that I think a big part of the problem with a lot of people getting um, off drugs is we have so many facilities and programs set up to stop people from using drugs. But in my personal story, what sustains me is doing things as far as that that gives me stability in life as a man. Um, Like I just recently, I bought a brand new car over the weekend. Uh, It was my first time ever financing a car. I always had to buy a car straight up, um, getting credit straight, um, becoming part of the community, um, having a a place where I feel um, that I'm valued. Definitely love, I think love is the, the main uh, thing. But all of these other things in my life that, I'm, that are placed in my life, having the support of Mel and ODAT, so all of these things are what helps me sustain me and keep me growing. And being surrounded around so many people that are doing great things and uh, making accomplishments in life, then that kind of just draws you to it. So those connections, the connections that you make along the way really do matter. Yes, uh, I think the connections are, are everything. Yeah. And just like the uh, connection uh, that you asked, but I would love, we would love to do uh, some things with Lisa. Um, I actually think they should make like a Lisa Kelly day in Philadelphia, <laughs> you know, and give her a, a day idea. out of the month, you know, and, and let it be a day of love and compassion and everybody just <laughs> do some, you know how they had to pay it forward <laughs> thing. Everybody just love somebody today. It's Lisa Kelly day. Thanks, Malik. That's, that's sweet. Great. I have to say, just 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 for the record, um, not everybody goes out and gets a double major, and certainly not in um, you know health and human services, behavioral health, and psychology. So you you are you're very humble, um, yes, which is pretty amazing. Humble. Thank you. That's an incredible accomplishment Thank and you. an incredible goal that you've set for yourself. But then you talk about um, buying your first car, and how exciting was that to get the keys and, and drive off the lot with that new car smell and and know that you worked really hard for it. Yeah, it was it was great. Like when I was caught up into the addiction, all of those things didn't matter. Right. Those are like the real life things. I want to stay away from that, and you know, so that's part of being an adult and starting to look at what is my credit like, and I want to buy a home uh, soon and you know, establish, uh, have life insurance today, you know, something I never had before. You know, a lot of the things that I'm doing today, I just didn't have, you know, because now it's more, when you feel more connected to something else bigger than you, um, it's strengthening it on my low days, which I don't have too many of. um, But anytime I'm feeling down, it's it's just I'm connected to something bigger than me, and it's easier to, to get through it. And then I know that people are watching me, and that makes me um, want to get through it uh, just to show someone else that, you know, you can get through this too. Has anyone heard your stories as being a part of this campaign or being part of the community conversations and said, I'm you, or I know someone who's like you, or what has it been like engaging with other folks? Well, for me, it's been great. I haven't had anyone per se just come, because I work in the field anyway, so I I, I contact and conversate with a lot of people, but all of the, I've gotten so many calls, I've seen strangers walk up to me and say, hey, I saw you on a bus. (laughs) I've had people uh, text me and send me pictures, "Uh, Malik, you're on a billboard. And so it did spark a lot of conversations, and I didn't really want to do this. that's what you had said in yeah, your blog. I, I, you said you didn't I, really want to really do it. I really didn't want to do it just because, uh, like you said, the stigma that is out there, and I kind of like, whoo, opened up my personal life to, to the city. <laughs> and so it was some thought behind it. But I went ahead with it just because it was presented to me. I, I believe I kind of, I'm a spiritual person, so I believe that everything happens for a reason. So I was like, this is something in here uh, for me to grow. And it did help me grow. Again, we're so most appreciative of being able to be a part of, of your journeys, and hopefully, you know, it's helpful. 
um, to be a part of the campaign and to um, to be here today talking on our first our, on our first podcast, uh, which is really um, you know for us to just continue to to sort of break down the stigma of addiction and the only way we really know how to do that is just to continue to talk, continue the conversation. So I'm I'm really encouraged to hear that maybe people aren't saying hey that's my story to you Malik, but what they're saying is I know you. Yeah. And I think there's a part of that that is saying, by knowing you, I'm connected to you. I'm connected to your story. One thing we've talked about is the barrier of stigma. And, you know, your involvement in, in the Someone You Know campaign, um, the IBC Foundation, has been tremendous. You're bringing completely different sort of stories. You're bringing a very personal connection. But what do we want to do about stigma going forward? So I know what I do personally is I post about it on social media. Um, You know, it reaches so many people. And even if people don't comment on what you've said, they're still reading it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got many, many um, messages in my inbox from people who said, I read your story and this is what's going on with me. You know, my son is out on the streets or or my daughter is, is suffering. Or maybe people, uh, you know, thought about someone in active addiction a certain way. And then by me, um, you know, telling stories and humanizing people, then maybe they've, they felt a different way afterwards. There's a lot of people who are working to break down the stigma of addiction and in, their own, in their own ways. But I think it's important that that repetition of people hearing it from you, um, you're a voice. You know, you're a voice and you're a force and... Um, it may seem like it's just the storefront in Kensington, but I think it's so much bigger than that. Um, and hopefully it'll continue to, to build momentum and, and to grow and that your voice continues to be heard. And, and that's a great thing about social media is it can amplify a message pretty quickly. So your advice is then just keep talking. Just keep talking. You know, talk about it. Um, talk about it with your friends. Talk about it with people who you don't think have anything to do with it. Um, I have a a button on my coat from this organization called Soul Collective that does outreach on the streets, and it says um, naloxone saves lives. So naloxone is the antidote to an opioid overdose. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten many conversations from just wearing that pin around. Some people don't even know what naloxone is. So then that gives me a chance to, like, educate them about it and say, you can get it too from your pharmacy. And then some people say, thank you for wearing that and spreading the word. I think that's really great, though, the way that, you know, both on social media, but also a little more subtly. How about you, Malik? First, I'll say that um, I think addressing the stigma and talking about it is definitely a, a major, major thing. It's even still hard for me today sometimes in certain arenas to speak about um, addiction or at least my personal attachment to addiction. I think it would be a lot more harder if I was just early on in my, more early in my process. And that's just because that's what the stigma, you know, people is it, is a thing where you'll be feel shameful, you could feel embarrassed. Um, just the way that people or society as a whole will look at you. I definitely, I said all that to say that I think this is great what you guys are doing because it does start to break down the stigma. People do start to talking about it. The more people talk about it, the more we're able to help people. Some people you may not even know because there's no exact one type of addict. There's a lot of addicts that you wouldn't even know are using. How hard is it to reconcile that another person's judgment might be the one thing that's preventing someone from asking for help? I I think it's sad. The only way to combat that is to speak about it more and to make it more general conversation uh, to where as though someone would be more adept to just say, hey, yeah, uh, I have a... Uh, issue or I need some help and not feel you're being looked down on mm-hmm. or pushed to make a decision that you're not ready to make at that moment. Right. right. And that's an important part of the of the process is when you're ready. What's always been a big thing of me is is being able to associate myself with someone, seeing people like uh, the gentleman, it's a gentleman that works uh, here at IBX that's in recovery. Seeing someone making it in life successfully is a powerful thing. I think that's very powerful because it makes you feel like, okay, you know what? If he was where I was and he's there now, then I can do it too. You know, so I think just more people stepping up and saying, hey, 
I'm someone that you wouldn't even think was an addict, but I am. So that's why the Someone You Know campaign, I think it was like right on target for exposing that and getting it, starting to get it out there. But I think more people need to adapt that concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to change, well, with your help, we want to change the narrative of how people see addiction and starting with stigma. Yeah, and I think um, it isn't even about the destination. It's just the journey and getting there and going through the processes and really just being in the a, in a frame of mind to want to do some things, to want to grow, want to change. Malik, there's no doubt in my mind, you have one of the strongest growth mindset of anyone I've ever <laughs> met. <laughs> thank you. Truthfully, um, you're exemplary. Um, oh, thank you. And I know that, you know, you are humble. Um, I have such a great deal of respect for both of you. And, you know, again, I cannot thank you enough for wanting to participate. And um, we're in this with you. And just know that uh, we'll continue to have the conversation, to hold conversations, to bring people into the conversation. We'll do our part. And we'll look to you to help us understand, you know, how we can better do our part. And, you know, I look forward to working with both of you continued in the future. I look forward to coming to visit the storefront. And Malik, I look forward to hearing about your graduation and all the great work that you continue to do with ODAT. Thank you. Thank you both so, so much. Thank, Thank you, you guys so much. Thank you. If you or someone you know is suffering from opioid addiction, please visit ibxfoundation.org slash SYK. The link is in our show notes below.